Seven Deadly Innocent Frauds of Economic Policy by Warren Mosler Deadly Innocent Fraud Number One The federal government must raise funds through taxation or borrowing in order to spend. In other words, government spending is limited by its ability to tax or borrow. Fact Federal government spending is in no case operationally constrained by revenues, meaning that there is no solvency risk. In other words, the federal government can always make any and all payments in its own currency, no matter how large the deficit is or how few taxes it collects. Ask any congressman, as I have many times, or private citizen how it all works, and he or she will tell you emphatically that the government has to either tax or borrow to get the funds to spend, just like any household has to somehow get the money it needs to spend. And from this comes the inevitable question about health care, defense, social security, and any and all government spending how are you going to pay for it? This is the killer question, the one no one gets right. And getting the answer to this question right is the core of the public purpose behind writing this book. In the next few moments of reading, it will all be revealed to you with no theory and no philosophy, just a few hard cold facts. I answer this question by first looking at exactly how government taxes, followed by how government spends. How does the federal government tax? Let's start by looking at what happens if you pay your taxes by writing a check. When the U.S. government gets your check and it's deposited and clears, all the government does is change the number in your checking account downward as they subtract the amount of your check from your bank balance. Does the government actually get anything real to give to someone else? No, it's not like there's a gold coin to spend. You can actually see this happen with online banking. Watch the balance in your bank account on your computer screen. Suppose the balance in your account is $5,000 and you write a check to the government for $2,000. When that check clears, gets processed, what happens? The five turns into a three, and your new balance is now down to $3,000, all before your very eyes. The government didn't actually get anything to give someone else. No gold coin dropped into a bucket at the Fed. They just changed numbers in bank accounts. Nothing went anywhere. And what happens if you were to go to your local IRS office to pay your taxes with actual cash? First, you would hand over your pile of currency to the person on duty as payment. Next, he'd count it, give you a receipt, and hopefully a thank you for helping to pay for Social Security, interest on the national debt, and the Iraq war. Then, after you, the taxpayer, left the room. He'd take that hard-earned cash you just forked over and throw it in a shredder. Yes, it gets thrown away, destroyed. Why? There's no further use for it. Just like a ticket to the Super Bowl, after you enter the stadium and hand the attendant a ticket that was worth maybe a $1,000, he tears it up and discards it. In fact, you can actually buy shredded money in Washington, D.C. So if the government throws away your cash after collecting it, how does that cash pay for anything, like Social Security and the rest of government spending? It doesn't. Can you now see why it makes no sense at all to think that the government has to get money by taxing in order to spend? In no case does it actually get anything that it subsequently uses. 
So if the government doesn't actually get anything when it taxes, how and what does it spend? How the federal government spends. Imagine you're expecting your $2,000 social security payment to hit your bank account, which already has $3,000 in it. If you are watching your account on the computer screen, you can see how government spends without having anything to spend. Presto! Suddenly, your account statement that reads $3,000 now reads $5,000. What did the government do to give you that money? It simply changed the number in your bank account from 3000 to 5000 It didn't take a gold coin and hammer it into a computer. All it did was change a number in your bank account by making data entries on its own spreadsheet, which is linked to other spreadsheets in the banking system. Government spending is all done by data entry on its own spreadsheet called the U.S. Dollar Monetary System. Here is a quote from the good Federal Reserve Bank Chairman Ben Bernanke on 60 Minutes for support. Scott Pelley. Is that tax money that the Fed is spending? Chairman Bernanke. It's not tax money. The banks have accounts with the Fed much the same way that you have an account in a commercial bank. So to lend to a bank, we simply use the computer to mark up the size of the account that they have with the Fed. The chairman of the Federal Reserve Bank is telling us in plain English that they give out money, spend and lend, simply by changing numbers in bank accounts. There is no such thing as having to get taxes or borrow to make a spreadsheet entry that we call government spending. Computer data doesn't come from anywhere. Everyone knows that. Where else do you see this happen? Your team kicks a field goal, and on the scoreboard, the score changes from, say, 7 points to 10 points. Does anyone wonder where the stadium got those 3 points? Of course not. Or you knock down 5 pins at the bowling alley, and your score goes from 10 to 15. Do you worry about where the bowling alley got those points? Do you think all bowling alleys and football stadiums should have a reserve of points and a lockbox to make sure you can get the points you have scored? Of course not. And if the bowling alley discovers you foot faulted and lowers your score back down by five points, does the bowling alley now have more score to give out? Of course not. We all know how data entry works but somehow this has gotten turned upside down and backwards by our politicians, media, and, most all, the prominent mainstream economists. Just keep this in mind as a starting point. The federal government doesn't ever have, or not have, any dollars. It's just like the stadium, which doesn't have, or not have, a hoard of points to give out. When it comes to the dollar, our government, working through its federal agencies, the Federal Reserve Bank and the U.S. Treasury Department, is the scorekeeper, and it also makes the rules. You now have the operational answer to the question, how are we going to pay for it? And the answer is, the same way government pays for anything. It changes the numbers in our bank accounts. The federal government is going to run out of money, as our president has mistakenly repeated. There is no such thing, nor is it dependent on getting dollars from China or anywhere else. All it takes for the government to spend is for it to change the numbers up in bank accounts at its own bank, the Federal Reserve Bank. There is no numerical limit to how much money our government can spend, whenever it wants to spend. This includes making interest payments as well as Social Security and Medicare payments. It encompasses all government payments made in dollars to anyone. This is not to say that excess government spending won't possibly cause prices to go up, which is inflation. 
but it is to say that the government can't go broke and can't be bankrupt. There is simply no such thing. I know you've got this question on your mind right now. I answer it a bit later in this book, but let me state the question and give you a quick answer to tide you over. Question. If the government doesn't tax because it needs the money to spend, why tax at all? Answer. The federal government taxes to regulate what economists call aggregate demand, which is a fancy word for spending power. In short, that means that if the economy is too hot, then raising taxes will cool it down. And if it's too cold, likewise, cutting taxes will warm it up. Taxes aren't about getting money to spend. They are about regulating our spending power to make sure we don't have too much and cause inflation, or too little, which causes unemployment and recessions. So why does no one in government seem to get it? Why does the Ways and Means Committee in Congress worry about, how are we going to pay for it? It could be that they believe the popular notion that the federal government, just like any household, must somehow first get money to be able to spend it. Yes, they have heard that it's different for government, but they don't quite believe it, and there's never a convincing explanation that makes sense to them. What they all seem to miss is the difference between spending your own currency that only you create and spending a currency someone else creates. To properly use this common federal government household analogy in a meaningful way, we next look at an example of a currency created by a household. The story begins with parents creating coupons they then used to pay their children for doing various household chores. Additionally, to drive the model, the parents require the children to pay them a tax of 10 coupons a week to avoid punishment. This closely replicates taxation in the real economy, where we have to pay our taxes or face penalties. The coupons are now the new household currency. Think of the parents as spending these coupons to purchase services, chores, from their children. With this new household currency, the parents, like the federal government, are now the issuer of their own currency. And now you can see how a household with its own currency is indeed very much like a government with its own currency. Let's begin by asking some questions about how this new household currency works. Do the parents have to somehow get coupons from their children before they can pay their coupons to their children to do chores? Of course not. In fact, the parents must first first spend their coupons by paying their children to do household chores, to be able to collect the payment of 10 coupons a week from their children. How else can the children get the coupons they owe to their parents? Likewise, in the real economy, the federal government, just like this household with its own coupons, doesn't have to get the dollars to s it spends from taxing or borrowing or anywhere else to be able to spend them. With modern technology, the federal government doesn't even have to print the dollars it spends the way the parents print their own co coupons. Remember, the federal government itself neither has nor doesn't have dollars, any more than the bowling alley ever has a box of points. When it comes to the dollar, our federal government is the scorekeeper. And how many coupons do the parents have in the parent-child coupon story? It doesn't matter. They could even just write down on a piece of paper how many coupons the children owe them, how many they have earned, and how many they've paid each other. When the federal government spends, the funds don't come from anywhere any more than the points come from any somewhere at the football stadium or the bowling alley. Nor does collecting taxes or borrowing somehow increase the government's hoard of funds available for spending. In fact, the people at the U.S. Treasury who actually spend the money by changing numbers on bank accounts up don't even have the telephone numbers of, nor are they in contact with, 
the people at the IRS who collect taxes. They change the numbers on bank accounts down. Or the other people at the U.S. Treasury who do the borrowing issue the Treasury securities. If it mattered at all how much was taxed or borrowed to be able to spend, you'd think they at least would know each other's phone numbers. Clearly, it doesn't matter for their purposes. From our point of view, not the federal government's, we need to first have U.S. dollars to be able to make payments, just like the children need to earn the coupons from their parents before they can make their weekly coupon payments. And state governments, cities, and businesses are all in that same boat as well. They all need to be able to somehow get dollars before they can spend them. That could mean earning them, borrowing them, or selling something to get the dollars they need to be able to spend. In fact, as a point of logic, the dollars we need to pay taxes must, directly or indirectly, from the inception of the currency, come from the government spending or government lending, which I'll discuss later. Now let's build a national currency from scratch. Imagine new, a new country with a newly announced currency. No one has any. Then the government proclaims, for example, that there will be a property tax. Well, how can it be paid? It can't until after the government starts spending. Only after the government spends its new currency does the population have the funds to pay the tax. To repeat, the funds to pay taxes from inception come from government spending or lending. Where else can they come from? For those of you who understand reserve account accounting, Note that the Fed can't do what's called a reserve drain without doing a reserve add. So what does the Fed do on settlement day when treasury balances increase? It does repos to add the funds to the banking system that banks then have to buy the treasury securities. Otherwise, the funds wouldn't be there to buy the treasury securities and the banks would have overdrafts in their reserve accounts. And what are overdrafts at the Fed? Functionally, an overdraft is a loan from the government. Ergo, one way or another, the funds used to buy the treasury securities come from the government itself. Because the funds to pay taxes or buy government securities come from government spending. The government is best thought of as spending first and then collecting taxes or borrowing later. Yes, that means that the government has to spend first to ultimately provide us with the funds we need to pay our taxes. The government, in this case, is just like the parents who have to spend their coupons first before they can start actually collecting them from their children. And neither the government nor the parents from inception can collect more of their own currency than they spend. Where else could it possibly come from? Note on how this works inside the banking system. When you pay taxes by writing a check to the federal government, they debit your bank's reserve account at the Federal Reserve Bank reserves. It can only come from the Fed. The private sector can't generate them. If your bank doesn't have any, the check you write results in an overdraft in that bank's reserves account. An overdraft is a loan from the Fed. So in any case, the funds to make payments to the federal government can only come from the federal government. So while our politicians truly believe the government needs to take our dollars, either by taxing or borrowing, for them to be able to spend, the truth is we need the federal government spending to get the funds we need to pay our taxes. We don't get to change numbers like the federal government does, or the bowling alley and the football stadium. Just a quick reminder that our state and local governments are users of the U.S. dollar and not issuers. Like the federal government is, in fact, the U.S. states are in a similar position as the rest of us. 
we both need to get funds into our bank accounts before we write our checks, or those checks will indeed bounce. In the parent-children -child analogy, we and the states are in much the same position as the children, who need to get first before they can give. And just like the children who have to earn or somehow get their coupons to make their coupon payments, we have to earn or somehow get U.S. dollars to make our tax payments. And as you now understand, this is just like it happens in any household that issues its own coupons. The coupons the kids need to make their payments to their parents have to come from their parents. And as previously stated, government spending is in no case operationally constrained by revenues, tax payments, and borrowings. Yes, there can be and there are self-imposed constraints on spending, but they're by Congress. But that's an entirely different matter. These include debt ceiling rules, treasury overdraft rules, and restrictions of the Fed buying securities from the treasury. They are all imposed by a Congress that does not have a working knowledge of the monetary system. And with our current monetary arrangements, all of those self-imposed constraints are counterproductive with regard to furthering public purpose. All they do is put blockages in the monetary plumbing that wouldn't otherwise be there. And from time to time, create problems that wouldn't otherwise arise. In fact, it was some of these self-imposed blockages that caused the latest financial crisis to spill over to the real economy and contribute to the recession. The fact that government spending is in no case operationally constrained by revenues means there is no solvency risk. In other words, the federal government can always make any and all payments in its own currency, no matter how large the deficit is or how few taxes it collects. This, however, does not mean that the government can spend all at once without consequence. Overspending can drive up prices and fuel inflation. What it does mean is that there is no solvency risk which is to say that the federal government can't go broke, and there's no such thing as our president running out of money to spend, as President Obama has incorrectly stated repeatedly. Nor, as President Obama also stated, is U.S. government spending limited by what it can borrow. So the next time you hear, where will the money for Social Security come from, go ahead and tell them, it's just data entry. It comes from the same place as your score at the bowling alley. Putting it yet another way, the U.S. government checks don't bounce, unless the government decides to bounce its own checks. Federal government checks don't bounce. A few years ago, I gave a talk titled Government Checks Don't Bounce in Australia at an economics conference. In the audience was the head of research for the Reserve Bank of Australia, Dr. David Gruen. It was high drama. I had been giving talks for several years to this group of academics, and I had not convinced most of them that government solvency was an issue, wasn't an issue. They always started with the familiar what Americans don't understand is that it's different for a small, open economy like Australia than it is for the United States. There seemed to be no way to get it through their, perhaps, over-educated skulls that at least for this purpose, none of that matters. A spreadsheet is a spreadsheet. All but one professor, Bill Mitchell, and a few of his colleagues seem to have this mental block and they deeply feared what would happen if the markets turned against Australia to somehow keep them from being able to finance the deficit. So I began my talk about how U.S. government checks don't bounce. And after a few minutes, 
David's hand shot up with the statement familiar to all modestly advanced economic students. If the interest rate on the debt is higher than the rate of growth of GDP, then the government's debt is unsustainable. This wasn't even presented as a question, but stated as a fact. I then replied, I'm an operations guy, type of guy, David. So tell me, what do you mean by the word unsustainable? Do you mean that if the interest rate is very high and that in 20 years from now the government debt has grown to a large enough number, the government won't be able to make its interest payments? And if it then writes a check to the pensioner, that that check will bounce? David got very quiet, deep in thought, thinking it through. You know, when I came here, I didn't think I'd have to think through how the Reserve Bank's check-clearing works, he stated, in an attempt at humor. But no one in the room laughed or made a sound. They were totally focused on what his answer might be. It was a showdown on this issue. David finally said, No, we'll clear the check but it will cause inflation and the currency will go down. That's what people mean by unsustainable. There was dead silence in the room. The long debate was over. Solvency is not an issue, even for a small open economy. Bill and I instantly commanded an elevated level of respect, which took the usual outward form of, well, of course, we always said that from the former doubters and skeptics. I continue with David. Well, I think most pensioners are concerned about whether the funds will be there when they retire and whether the Australian government will be able to pay them. To which David replied, No, I think they are worried about inflation and the level of the Australian dollar. Then Professor Martin Watts, head of the economics department at the University of Newcastle, inserted, The hell they are, David. At that, David very thoughtfully conceded, Yes, uh, I suppose you're right. So what was actually confirmed to the Sydney academics in, aud in attendance that day? Governments using their own currency can spend what they want when they want. Just like the football stadium can put points on the board at will. The consequences of overspending might be inflation or a falling currency, but never bounce checks. The fact is, government deficits can never cause a government to miss any size of payment. There is no solvency issue. There is no such thing as running out of money when spending is just changing numbers upwards in bank accounts at its own Federal Reserve Bank. Yes. Households, businesses, and even the states need to have dollars in their bank accounts when they write checks, or else those checks will bounce. That's because the dollars they spend are created by someone else, the federal government. And households, businesses, and the states are not the scorekeeper for the dollar. Why the federal government taxes? So why then does the federal government tax us if it doesn't actually get anything to spend or need to get anything to spend? Hint, it's the same reason that the parents demand 10 coupons a week from their children when the parents don't actually need the coupons for anything. There is a very good reason it, tax it, uh, it taxes us. Taxes create an ongoing need in the economy to get dollars and therefore an ongoing need for people to sell their goods and services and labor to get dollars. With tax liabilities in place, the government can buy things with its otherwise worthless dollars because someone needs the dollars to pay taxes. Just like the coupon tax on the children creates an ongoing need for the coupons, which can be earned by doing chores for the parents. Think of a property tax you're not ready to think about income taxes. It comes down to the same thing, but it's a lot more indirect and complicated. You have to pay the property tax in dollars or you lose or lose your home. It's just like the kids' situation as they need to get 10 coupons 
or face the consequences. So now you are motivated to sell things, goods, services, your own labor, to get the dollars you need. It's just like the kids who are motivated to do chores to get the coupons they need. Finally, I have to connect the dots for some people needing dollars, from some people needing dollars to pay their taxes to everyone wanting and using dollars for almost all of their buying and selling. To do that, let's go back to the example of a new country with a new currency, which I'll call the crown, where the government levies a property tax. Let's assume the government levies this tax for the further purpose of raising an army and offers jobs to soldiers who are paid in crowns. Suddenly, a lot of people who own property now need to get crowns, and many of them won't want to get crowns directly from the government by serving as soldiers. So they start offering their goods and services for sale in exchange for the new crowns they need and want, hoping to get these crowns without having to join the army. Other people now see many things for sale they would like to have, chickens, corn, clothing, and all kinds of services like haircuts, medical services, and many other services. The sellers of these goods and services want to receive crowns to avoid having to join the army to get the money they need to pay their taxes. The fact that all these things are being offered for sale in exchange for crowns makes some other people join the army to get the money needed to buy some of those goods and services. In fact, prices will adjust until as many soldiers as the government wants are enticed to join the army, because until that happens, there won't be enough crowns to spent by the government to allow the taxpayers to pay all of their taxes and those needing the crowns who don't want to go into the army will cut the prices of their goods and services as much as they have to in order to get them sold or else throw in the towel and join the army themselves the following is not merely a theoretical concept it's exactly what happened in africa in the 1800s when the British established colonies there to grow crops. The British offered jobs to the local population, but none of them were interested in earning British coins. So the British placed a hut tax on all of their dwellings, payable only in British coins. Suddenly, the area was monetized, as everyone now needed British coins, and the local population started offering things for sale as well as their labor to get the needed coins. The British could then hire them and pay them in British coins to work the fields and grow their crops. This is exactly what the parents did to get labor hours from their children to get the chores done. And that's exactly how what are called non-convertible currencies work. No more gold standards and very few fixed exchanges, exchange rates are, are left like the US dollar, Japanese yen, and British pound. Now we're ready to look at the role of taxes from a different angle, that of today's economy using the language of economics. A learned economist today would say that taxes function to reduce aggregate demand. Their term, aggregate demand, is just a fancy term for spending power. The government taxes us and takes away our money for one reason, so we have that much less to spend, which makes the currency that much more scarce and valuable. Taking away our money can also be thought of as leaving room for the government to spend without causing inflation. Think of the economy as one big department, department store full of all the goods and services we all produce and offer for sale every year. We all get paid enough in wages and profits to buy everything in that store assuming we would spend all the money we earn and all the profits we make. And if we borrow to spend, we can, even, we can buy even more than there is in that store. But when some of our money goes to pay taxes, we are left short of the spending power we need to buy all of what's for sale in the store. This gives government the room to buy what it wants, so that when it spends what it wants, the combined spending of government and the rest of us isn't too much for
for what's for sale in the store. However, when the government taxes too much relative, relative to its spending, total spending isn't enough to make sure everything in the store gets sold. When businesses can't sell all they produce, people lose their jobs and have even less money to spend, so even less gets sold. Then more people lose their jobs, and the economy goes into a downward spiral we call a recession. Keep in mind that the public purpose behind government doing all this is to provide a public infrastructure. This includes the military, the legal system, the legislature, and the executive branch of government, etc. So there is quite a bit that even the most conservative voters would have the government do. So I look at it this way. For the right amount of government spending, which we presume is necessary to run the nation the way we would like to see it run, how high should taxes be? The reason I look at it this way is because the right amount of government spending is an economic and political decision that, properly understood, has nothing to do with government finances. The real costs of running the government are the real goods and services it consumes. All the labor hours, fuel, electricity, steel, carbon fiber, hard drives, etc. that would otherwise be available for the private sector. So when the government takes those real resources for its own purposes, there are that many fewer real resources left for the private sector activity. For example, the real cost of the right size army with enough soldiers for defense is that there are fewer workers left in the private sector to grow the food, build the cars, do the doctoring and nursing and administrative tasks, sell us stocks and real estate, paint our houses, mow our lawns, etc., etc., etc. Therefore, the way I see it, we first set the size of government at the right level of public infrastructure based on real benefits and real costs and not the financial considerations. The monetary system is then the tool we use to achieve our real economic and political objectives and not the source of information as to what those objectives are. Then, after deciding what we need to spend to have the right size government, we adjust taxes so that we all have enough spending power to buy what's still for sale in the store after the government is done with its shopping. In general, I'd expect taxes to be quite a bit lower than government spending. For reasons already explained and also expanded on later in this book. In fact, a budget deficit of perhaps 5% of our gross domestic product might turn out to be the norm, which in today's economy is about $750 billion annually. However, that number by itself is of no particular economic consequence and could be a lot higher or a lot lower, depending on the circumstances. What matter is that the purpose of taxes is to balance the economy and make sure it's not too hot nor too cold. And federal government spending is set at this right amount given the size and scope of government we want. That means we should not grow the size of government to help the economy out of a slowdown. We should already be at the right size for government and therefore not add to it every time the economy slows down. So while increasing government spending during a slowdown will indeed make the numbers work and will end the recession, for me that is far less desirable than accomplishing the same thing with the right tax cuts in sufficient enough size to restore private sector spending to the desired amounts. Even worse is increasing the size of government just because the government might find itself with a surplus. Again, government finances tell us nothing about how large the government should be. That decision is totally independent of government finances. The right amount of government spending has nothing to do with the tax revenues or the ability to borrow as both of those are only tools for implementing policy on behalf of public purpose. 
and not reasons for spending or not spending, and not sources of revenue needed for actual government spending. I'll get specific on what role I see for government later in this book, but rest assured, my vision is for a far more streamlined and efficient government, one that is intensely focused on the basics of fundamental public purpose. Fortunately, there are readily available and infinitely sensible ways to do this. We can put the right incentives in place, which channel market forces with guidance to better promote the public purpose with far less regulation. This will result in a government and culture that will continue to be the envy of the world. It will be a government that expresses our American values of rewarding hard work and innovation and promoting equal opportunity, equitable outcomes, and enforceable laws and regulations we can respect with true pride. But I digress. Returning to the issue of how high taxes need to be, recall that if the government simply tried to buy what it wanted to buy and didn't take away any of our spending power, there would be no taxes. It would be too much money chasing too few goods, with the result being inflation. In fact, with no taxes, nothing would even be offered for sale in exchange for government money in the first place, as previously discussed. To prevent the government spending from causing that kind of inflation, the government must take away some of our spending power by taxing us, not to actually pay for anything, but so that their spending won't cause inflation. An economist would say it this way, taxes function to regulate aggregate demand, not to raise revenue per se. In other words, the government taxes us and takes away our money to prevent inflation, not to actually get our money in order to spend it. Restated one more time, taxes function to regulate the economy and not to get money for Congress to spend. And again, the government neither has nor doesn't have dollars. It simply changes m numbers in our bank accounts upward when it spends and downwards when it taxes. All of this is, presumably, for the public purpose of regulating the economy. But as long as government continues to believe this first of the seven deadly innocent frauds, that they need to get money from taxing or borrowing in order to spend, they will continue to support policies that constrain output and employment and prevent us from achieving what are otherwise readily available economic outcomes.